Welcome everyone to yet another video on the HP Prime. Uh, let me go ahead and apologize ahead of time if you hear me coughing. I'll try not to cough into the mic. A little bit out under the weather today, but I uh, hope that it doesn't affect the video too much. And there may also be buzzing in the audio due to uh, a very bad microphone. Hopefully I can get that changed in the near future. That said, let's go ahead and uh, jump right into this video. I'd like to share with you uh, a feature um, that they added, or I should say, um, modified or updated to the input command. So it used to be that the input command you could you couldn't really do much. Um, you could probably get, uh, I guess, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, up to seven input fields, but you couldn't position them like like you see here. It would just basically be first variable, then an input field, second variable, input field, third variable, input field, and so on. Now we can actually do things like have checkboxes. Um, they can either be independent checkboxes, or they could they could be set up so that um, you know, say here, for example, it's not the case here, but I could have it so that the the user can only check one of these three, so that checking one will untoggle any of the others. Um, or they can be all uh, independent. You can have also choose choose fields, or you can just have your regular old. Uh, input field. <clears throat> so it, what it essentially changes is just the variable definition. So before we would just have a list of variables, but now our variable list is actually a list of lists. Okay, so here's a list and then each variable each variable is defined by its own list uh, consisting of three components and they're all similar and yet different. So let me talk about this kind. This is your sort of default uh, input field. Um, here's where they're similar. Regardless of the the input field types, so, so here this is a choose type, for example, or this is a, a radio button or checkbox type. Regardless of the type, the first component in the variable definition must be the variable name. So this is where whatever data we have, you know, input into these fields they get stored into whatever the variables are in the first component of, the, of these lists. Now let's look at this particular input field. So this particular input field typically I'd like to uh, just have numbers here. So I'd like to restrict the user input to just real value uh, numbers as opposed to say complex values or a matrix or a string or what have you. And so the way we restrict the input type is to create a vector whose contents are integer values corresponding to types. So an integer value of zero actually corresponds to uh, a real real number. And if you're wondering how to figure out the rest of the types, there are a couple of ways to do this. If you go to the catalog and look up type, excuse me, and hit help you'll see 0 is real, 1 is an integer, two, so that's integer, that's a binary integer, or, or a, yeah, 2 is a string, 3 is a complex, and so on. So if we wanted to actually allow multiple types in, in this particular field, we would just expand this vector to have um, more integer values in there. So that's the second component of the variable definition. And then the third component is a list corresponding to sort of the geometry of this field relative to the entire screen. So the first number the first number is a percentage of the entire width of the screen. So that's 15% of the entire width. And it specifies how far to the right this input field will be moved. Uh, when it's drawn. So 15% of the entire field is this this distance here, just enough for us to fit in the phrase x min equals, and that's to be the left side of this input field. The second value is also a percentage of the entire width of the screen. So in this case 30% of the entire width of the screen. And uh, it basically specifies how wide this box is. So, so that's essentially it. And then the last component is the row number. So it's zero base. This is row zero. These two input fields are in row zero. These two input fields are in row one. These two in row two. This choose box is in row three and this is row four and so on. Okay. Um, now 
if you want to do a choose menu like this, then <clears throat> rather than the second component being a vector of allowed types, the second component is just a list of of strings, and <clears throat> it's what will appear here. This is a list that's one base, so surface will you know instead of returning the the string surface, what will be stored in into PT is either number one for surface, two for three D contour, and three for two D contour. Okay, and uh, the same business applies for the last component, except for this middle number. It doesn't seem to uh, obey that middle number at all because I specified 30 and you can clearly see that this is not 30% of the entire width of the screen. This is probably closer to 70% of the entire width of the screen. So either that's a bug or undocumented feature, I don't know, maybe they'll fix that in the near future. But right now it doesn't seem like we can specify the, the width of this choose box. And it's kind of unfortunate because that's a lot of you know white space that is really unnecessary there. <clears throat> Lastly, the checkboxes. So checkboxes can be completely independent of each other. And to specify a checkbox check rather than a vector, you can use just the real numbers. So if I use 0, then uh, that specifies that this is a checkbox that's completely independent of other checkboxes. On the other hand, if I um, enumerate them from starting from 1, then uh, all those enumerated checkboxes will be tied together so that you can only check one among all of them. So if I wanted to tie all three of these together, I would use one here, two here, and three here so that <clears throat> I can only toggle one of these and not uh, more than one. And then I think that's about it. That's the advanced form of the input screen, and what's nice about that is now you can ask for lots of different um, input in a single screen. And I've used it here in the 3D grapher, so now we can do things like select whether or not we want transparent graphs or, or uh, opaque graphs, and whether or not we want to show the wireframe and so on, whereas before the previous version everyone had to kind of manually type those options in. Um, that brings me to um, some of the features that I've added to the 3D graphing app. Uh, so I guess I'll finish up this video by sharing some of the features I've, I've added. <clears throat> so the first thing is um, we can now make multiple plots. I can plot uh, multiple functions. So maybe I'll, I'll keep it simple and, and plot these two. And um, so that's that. We, so that's both of these. I can change the coloring scheme. So this is a coloring scheme that we, we've seen before. <clears throat> and we can change the coloring scheme to be based off of the Z values. Uh, I'm just toggling the coloring scheme by hitting plus or minus. And then, oops, I think I hit that. Yeah, there we go. That was done too, mu too many times. Let's try that one more time. So now this, uh, this is the default color scheme, actually. So the colors that you see here actually correspond to the colors in this box here. And if I change this, for example, to, I don't know, um, let's see, what's an interesting color? Let's do something like that. Uh, there we go, kind of like an aqua green. So now when I hit plot, then the graph changes accordingly. Um, and again, I can toggle through different coloring schemes. I can also um, use trace mode and I can toggle through the different graphs. So right now the trace is on this particular curve. Again we can also change the, the coloring scheme if we want to. Uh, usually for trace mode I would recommend this color scheme so that you can actually kind of see um, which graph is which. But if you want to switch over to the other function then hit plus or minus and we switch out okay, to um, you can also move the graph up and down for example you know if if the numbers down at the bottom are covering up your graph you can move it or or other way around the graph is covering up the numbers you can move this graph around and you can it recenter it by just hitting the number five to recenter so, <coughs> 
So let's just exit out of there. Some other options we can do. We can switch off transparency. Um, and what that does is it makes the graph um, do hidden line removal. So here we see some clipping in the Z values. Um, so things that you can't see are, are you know blocked and whatnot. And we can even get really fancy and do something like turn off the the grid. This is a little makes it a little harder to see the shape of the graph. You know, having that wireframe there is really useful. You can you can still do the tracing. Um, it seems a little weird here, like you've got this line here, but it's because remember that this uh, green surface is blocking the orange surface there. So um, there are pros and cons to different different modes, but that's why they're there. Okay, so there we are, back to the uh, my my preferred um, settings, and we can also do things like choose to do a 3D contour. Now I've set it so that you can only do you um, it will only show one function at a time, and the reason for that is because uh, otherwise it's just too slow. So if you have multiple functions selected, when you hit plot after you change the plot setting, it will ask you to pick one among those that you've selected already. And if only one is selected, then you won't see this little menu up here. So let's say that we decide to uh, get the 3D contour of our first function here. All right, so it still it <coughs> remembers the color scheme that we had, so we can switch off uh, that or switch on over to the uh, XY gradient color mode, or we can switch off over to Z gradient mode. Excuse me, which is probably more common for. Um, contours since we want each contour level to be of a different color. Uh, that's the 3D contour. We can also do 2D contours. Okay, so when I hit pot, 2D contour, select a function. If I select this one, then here we are. So this is what we see. Um, I probably need to edit this so that the color scheme here better matches the color scheme in the 3D contour. I think the colors might be inverted, um, but that shouldn't be too big of a deal. So there you have it. Uh, updates to this. So some things I'd like to add in are little features like maybe injecting a, a tangent plane or finding local maxes and mins and whatnot. But for now, I think this will will do and. Uh, just want to say thanks again for watching and I hope to catch you all next video.